Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with Chicago jazz bassist, composer, and educator Clark Summers. He was a part of the new 2022 CD, To Chicago with Love, done with Adam Larson. And over his career, he has toured and performed extensively throughout the world. He's had the privilege of performing with the likes of Cedar Walton, Brian Blade, Ernie Watts, Von Freeman, Iris Sullivan, Frank West, and so many others. He's a deep cat with great stories and insights. Enjoy the story. So, hey, Clark, man, thanks for taking a minute out for Neon Jazz. I appreciate it. No, my, my pleasure, man. Great to be thought of. Right on. Well, you know, the one thing is I've always heard you on the jazz radar, but it came into hyper focus when I interviewed Adam Larson recently about his latest album and your collaboration on the album. So I guess that's kind of where I want to start. But before even that, you know, to be able to put out new material during this time of COVID, no live shows and just everything being scattered, how does it feel to have new material out now that hopefully things are opening up a little bit now? Well, it's a, it's a blessing, and it, it makes, I think, all of us remember what is actually important because we couldn't be together and play during, you know, the pandemic and the quarantine. And, and so I think it, I think it does have a little extra gravity. Collaborations have more gravity to them and they, they, they come with more meaning and there's an awareness of how ephemeral all this is, you know. So that project was, is, was and is very special for me. I, I, I consider Adam a very close friend. And we've been working together since about 2014, and I just, I've always respected what he brings to the table and his passion for the music, and and it just was a really cool culmination for us. And and of course with Dana Hall, who I play with and have played with for over 20 years, and I I think we were all just really happy how it sort of came together, and it was pretty effortless. You know, we did it in a really we did a short, you know, hour long rehearsal. We played a gig that night and then we did the recording in under four hours the next day. I just think I am not, I'm not taking anything for granted at this point. You know, I mean, I mean, I think things are so, they're just still very precarious. Um, and so, yeah, I, I was really gratified with the results, you know, and, and it's about the people, you know, and I think we care about each other, and I think it shows in the music. Man, I almost hesitate. I've been really doing a lot of interviews since March of 2020. I mean, I actually ramped up considerably since then, and I have hesitated to say, hey, things are getting better, things are opening up. I almost feel like I need to just have wood all around me to knock on because mm. it, it's, fri it's frightful, man. I mean, we've gone, we've undulated from – you know, that first wave of shots to saying, all right, let's get back at it, and then Delta, and then let's get back at it, and then Omicron, it's like it just, it undulates, it's it's bad, you know, so. Um, well, that's a good way to put it, I, I, and I, I totally agree. It just, we don't know what's around the corner. What can you do but embrace the moment that we're in and, and be grateful for that? I mean, it sounds you know, ethereal or kind of new agey, but I, but I really, I, I don't know how else to look at things at this point. But I agree with you. I, I think it would be unevolved to not think that way after what we've gone through. I mean, it's our level of like not being in control of things. I think that's been the most, one of the more magnanimous lessons that we've learned from all of this. But, you know, the world has a monopoly on us. We decide that we either sink or swim, you know, and mm -hmm. that's, that's mm -hmm. kind of, kind of the nature of things. But, you know, I was thinking, you know, I'm 49, and I was thinking when I used to read, like, the Weekly Reader and all those little magazines when I was a kid, and I'd see movies like Back to the Future where he'd have that hazmat suit on and all of that. And it, it's not too surprising to me that in the year 2020, there would be a pandemic that would come around, and there would be things that would get magnified, like racism and, and, and the working class being at war with, with you know, the upper crust of the country. It's just not really all that surprising. It's bad to live through, but it's not surprising to me. It is. Um, I, I think you're exactly right, and, and and I think that's that's you know perhaps for me what's most disconcerting about it is the fact that it's not surprising that yeah. people see the signs, people, you know, people can anticipate this stuff, and still we as a collective kind of avoid addressing it and avoid 
uh, you know, staving it off. You know, so I, I, I feel like that's troublesome. You know, I think that is the, is the per, more sort of pervasive underlying, uh, you know, foreboding aspect of it that, look, why, why are we not looking out for, I mean, why are we not looking out for people? Why are we not trying to figure this out, you know? And, and why are we thinking that we can just leave it for the next generation? I mean, clearly we can't. Clearly things are, you know, they, they come upon us and, and we have to face them. And I, I feel like, you know, we, we end up, you know, kind of doing ourselves a disservice because it's, it's, I don't want to say it's too late, but it's like, look, you know, with regard to, you know, race, gender equality, you know, um, socioeconomic issues, um, gender, you know, uh, you know, supply shortages, what are we trying to do here? You know, the, the, the climate issues, what are we waiting for? You know, so I think, I don't know, it just, I think all of with, with, with keeping all that in mind, I think, I think it just puts a little more gravity on the choices that we make. You know, it's like, well, I don't think anything can really be that trivial anymore. I don't think we can afford to proceed with that, like with any kind of, like flippancy that because because things are precarious it's like no you can't guarantee that i'll have this jazz career such as it is you know in two years or a year because nobody thought we'd be in a lockdown i mean i was doing you know i was enjoying the the kind of you know in quotes career that i thought that i had cultivated for myself and traveling around the world and that just went up in smoke you know, as yeah. soon as we went into a lockdown, and 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 I'm I'm you know, I'm just one person. I mean, and I, and still I had it I had it good. I still feel like I was one of the lucky ones. You know what I mean? In spite of all that, I just think, what are we waiting for in in confronting this stuff? And and yet here we are. You know, and then this thing in Ukraine is, it's just absolutely so disheartening and. It's like what? What do we? Get? What is all this? What's? It's so hard to even process it. And then, and then you know, to try to, to try to sort of, be committed and passionate about art and music and the process that people who live a life of of pursuing that. It's so hard to like balance that with what's going on in the world. You know what I mean? I mean, it's like yeah. How seriously am I supposed to take all this? You know, when there's all this, it's 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 a weird. I mean, I I I know that's rhetorical, and I know, you know, we got to do our thing regardless of what's going on around us. But it's it's like it's it's there. It's in it's it's in the air, you know, and it's hard not to be thinking about it all the time, you know. So I don't know. I don't really know what the answer is. It just feels fun. It just feels like a funny time. It's like oh, I don't have my my gigs, you know. It's like well, man think about it's not hard to think about the contrast of my situation and look these people are these people's lives are ruined in the ukraine they're i mean if they're not if they're not being killed you know then their lives are ruined yeah. you know what i mean i mean it's just unimaginable i don't mean to get so intense about it so quickly into this but I just got done listening to the the daily, <laughs> you know, and it's like, man, it's rough, you know, and so like my problems are not real problems, you know, so I try to keep that in, in mind as I'm going along here. Well, you know, and, and as an artist too, your you know your 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 emotional fortitude is heightened, and and I get all that, and I I think the thing that gets me is when I'm reading about what's going on with the Russians, like they're caught in the crosshairs of something they completely don't agree with and didn't want to be involved with and now they're going to get imprisoned if they do like i've interviewed musicians over in russia for like the past some odd years five six seven if not longer and you know they're like talking about you know just being able to be free now to have you know the arts and music and jazz and to do this and now it's all gone it's it's the iron curtain again if you do anything over there Everybody's going to be looking out for each other. They're talking about you know, the intellectuals and the people that know what's going on are leaving. And companies are pulling out. These poor people that just try to fight for a ruble are going to get destroyed while the Kremlin and all these other guys with power just ride their horse like nothing's happening. You know, so, it, yeah, it's, it, 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 I mean, it's a drag to get up. But I think, 
you know, the thing that I've thought about over this time, being an artist, being a musician, is that, you know, for most of our lives, we didn't have anything as magnanimous as what we've lived through now. I mean, we had 9-11, and it seemed like that kind of was under a microscope for about a week or two, and then it kind of filtered away, and other little mm. things here and there. But this is the entire planet for two years and counting, um, the, the big Bob Dylan moment, so to speak, for artists. I mean, this is the time mm. I think that we need art the most. We need to say something, and people need that because we're consuming art, at a record level right now. Mm-hmm. So you're right. Uh, I think you're absolutely like what, right. You know what you're doing. I mean, if we didn't have Netflix, we didn't have visual arts, we didn't have cats like you making music. This would have been very dark. I mean, if the internet wasn't around, you know, mm-hmm. and and to feel that you know pseudo connectivity through an IP address, it would have been really really bad and stark in a different way, you know. So I think. I guess what I'm trying to say to you from what I'm seeing on my end of the microphone, I see the function of you cats putting music out is not only progress and evolution, but it's very needed because there could be someone in the Ukraine or someone in Russia that's going to listen to your album and it's going to make them hopeful. And it's necessary. Art is very necessary. It's not ancillary. We need this to like be hopeful and stay alive and keep our heart beating. Yeah, and of course I completely agree with that you know it's just um yeah i mean it, it, absolutely that's that's what we aspire to you know that's how we i think that, that that that's a major motivating factor for sure you know i guess just kind of double down on what we do and try to make it the best we can i mean that's that's my attitude about it just be as true to it and honest and and thorough that's that's just just exactly how i think of it let's go back to how you uh, had you got into jazz and loved it back in the beginning talk to me about where you were born and raised and kind of how you the 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 jaws of jazz got into you and and became who you are now i grew up uh in a suburb north of chicago called lake forest i got i got into the uh well, I got into. I started on drums. I think this is probably somewhat typical and kind of not that interesting. But I started on drums in the seventh grade. I switched to the electric bass in the eighth grade when the you know the rock band in my junior high didn't have a bass player. No surprise, right? Nobody wanted to play bass, and there's no you know just instant gra- instant gratification coming from that instrument, especially at that age, you know. Um, like like there is with the guitar or the drums or you know you just you can just hit stuff with when you play the drums and you can learn a couple bar chords on the on the guitar and you can you know you can get you can get girls or whatever it is you know so i just got into it and um took lessons at the local music store and and just kind of really got the bug early for it and then I think I got really lucky my sophomore year. A uh, great bass player lived in Chicago at the time, um, James Kamak. He plays with Ahmad Jamal. He's an incredible bass player. He came to my high school and he put up flyers advertising, uh, you know, that he provided lessons for people. And so I didn't know who Ahmad Jamal was when I was 15 years old. I went home and I told my mom that, and she said, Oh, I know who Ahmad Jamal is, you know, because they're of a similar generation. And so he would start coming to my house. He got me very, very uh, hooked on it. And uh, I switched to upright my junior year. And then when I switched to upright, that's when everything changed. I just, it was kind of, I kind of remember it being pretty immediate. Just the the moment that I picked it up, I knew, I just kind of knew that was it. And, um, and then from there, you know, things just unfolded. I got really serious about it. I went to uh, DePaul for two years in 95. You know, immersed myself on the Chicago jazz scene uh, and met all these incredible people and was given a number of meaningful experiences and opportunities, most of which I wasn't ready to, to receive at the time. But I, but I, I nonetheless... Uh, was there, and there weren't that many upright bass players on the scene at, at, at that time in Chicago, and, and I just said, well, I'm not going to, I was too young or, you know, 
um, oblivious to realize I wasn't probably really ready for these experiences, but I, I, I was lucky and took a couple, I uh, did a couple years at DePaul and then I took three years off and I toured with a swing band. I'm sure you remember in the mid nineties, late nineties, there was a huge swing band revival. And so I toured with this band, the mighty blue Kings for a couple years, um, went all over the country, went to Europe a couple of times. And then I, Finished my undergrad at uh, California Institute of the Arts in 2000. I went back in 2000, finished in 2002. And then I stayed in Chicago for five years. I moved to New York for two years in 2008. And then just things, you know, just kind of kept unfolding. And, um, you know, I mean, long story short, I mean, here we are, you know. But, yeah, I, I, I got lucky. I got lucky with... Jim Kamak coming to the to the school and he he really he he put me on the right path you know he brought records for me to check out and he he just kind of kept me in line it was it was really an amazing relationship because he had just had a, a newborn baby and he would he would bring the kid in a little uh, kind of a um, um, you know he would bring his kid and my mom would watch the kid while he gave me the lesson in the basement and then he would come upstairs. And he would have dinner with my family, and it was it was really unbelievable. He was a very generous spirit. He could see that I was really serious and self motivated, you know. And so, you know, things just went from there. Um, I just I got lucky with kind of different teachers and mentors along the way. I, I spent time, you know, with Kelly Sill in Chicago and. Then I went to when I went to Cal Arts, I studied with Charlie Hayden, you know, and that was a big life changer. I was already a huge fan of his before I went, and he was, you know, profound, you know. And um, so I've just, I've just been really lucky. I've been really lucky, and I've had a lot of support. And I mean, I could, you know, I, I'm kind of scattering the details around, but I, you know, it, I'm happy to get into specific things, but, you know, um, I just, um, I've just kind of been lucky that I've had this, um, and it, like an internal, just, um, desire to stay on the path and, and, and I, I never had to be forced to do it. I, and I feel like that was my best attribute. You know what I mean? That I, I always had my own sense of intrinsic motivation and, um, I think it's really hard to make people kind of fall in love with the music. And if you don't, if you don't have that, I think it's going to be really hard to kind of get inside of, you know, the degrees of work and commitment that, that are required to, to sort of, to really deal with, with the music in a, on a certain level. And so that, that's always been, I've always been grateful, whatever that is, if that's, you know, genetics or biology, you know, I don't, I don't really know, but I just, I, I love, I always loved the music. I always loved the, the process as a lifestyle, you know? And so it was never challenging for me to go in the basement when I was in high school and stay down there for three, four, five, six hours, you know, and listen to records and try to practice and figure, figure things out, you know? And that's just, I've always been able to sort of, you know, prepare, you know, to to be cool with preparing and sort of dealing with shortcomings. I mean, I think that was so much more important than any modicum of talent that I had for the music or on the instrument. You know, I always say that, that my talent was that I I could do the work and not not have to be told and not sort of complain about or not sort of overly criticize my whatever natural ability that I had because I just, it was more just a, it was just more about the process of it than anything else. And I think that just in and of itself kind of has helped open doors for me. You know, it's just, it's like, well, it's just, it's not something that I take for granted. I don't, I don't feel entitled to any of it. There are dozens of people with, you know, a, a much more talent than I have. And so I just recognize the reality of things, and I, I've just been lucky that I 
I care just only really about the process of it and 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 the, the kind of getting inside of the details and and figuring stuff out, you know, and and deepening my relationship with with the music and with the history of the music and with musicians. So that's always kind of driven me, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And and the beauty of that answer right there, the zigzag of it is that it's like missile command. You hit all kinds of different questions I was going to ask in between. But of all of the things that you were talking about, it seems as though in your lineage and your career, there's there's been this group of, of legends and luminaries that you've been around. I mean, you were talking about Charlie. I mean, you got Brian mm. Blade, Vaughn Freeman, long time mm. Chicago, and Iris Solomon. I mean, it goes on and on and on. But what I'm curious about is what did these legends and these luminaries in the world of jazz teach you that you in turn teach younger players that you get around? What flame did they give you or what what fire did they give to your torch that you continue to pass on? That's a good question. I mean the the thread that I that I picked up on was kind of I mean in a way what I'm talking about, which is if you take care of the music, it will take care of you. And each of them had their own way of saying it. And in fact, I think a couple of those people, I mean, said exactly that to me. And I mean, it sounds like just some, you know, fortune cookie, you know, saying that you get, but it, it really is true. If you don't worry about the other noise, the other external, you know, stimuli, the other, the other, the other traps, that are so prevalent right now, if you can just stay focused on that, that this is what they all would say, you know, then you're going to be fine. And, and, and um, they really emphasized the work ethic. They emphasized gratitude. They emphasized humility. Um, ask questions. You know, make your teachers work. I mean, all of them, all and all those people that you just mentioned, each one of them, Wade, Ira, Vaughn, they were so generous with information they they wanted you to succeed and it wasn't about it was never about um you know i think there's a little confusion with with some, you know i don't i don't want to you know pigeonhole anybody but with sounding like um you know young youngish people feel like you know you got to you got to reinvent the wheel you know you got to you got to like break through the glass ceiling and it's like yeah sure that's that 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 um, value has been sort of it runs alongside the the jazz kind of you know ideal that things are always evolving, always changing. But they emphasize just just play just play well, play in the play in the context that you're in. Don't don't be something you're not. You know, you can't be something that you're not. You're you can only be you. You can you can transcribe all the Ray Brown you want. You can do all the, you know, train so whatever. But you you're gonna be you. Whether you, you just can't run from that. And I think they, they they emphasize you know the more you embrace that and just take care of the details, just very matter of fact. You know, then it will it will be people re, will respond to that. You know, and and that was the, you know, sure I can I could get into the details of music craft but the, we know that those raw materials are they're out there for everybody they're all the same raw materials it's it's how do you as an individual kind of uh get those things to coalesce and then to to repro like repurpose them for your own use you know so their thing was more about gratitude it was more about it was sort of like well if you're already here if we're having this conversation you know, it's like, well, this is, this seems right. And, you know, just keep, keep, keep being humble and keep doing the work. And then, I mean, it sounds so simplistic, but you know, like anybody, like, yeah, just get to the top of the mountain, right? Yeah, it's simple, right? No, it's not. Like you have, it's, so it's really hard to get young people to understand, look, just, just, just keep your head down and do the work. And be great, you know, grateful. I mean, I'm just grateful to get a mode of expression. Like we're just looking for that, you know. And that was, that is, that's kind of what was stamped out during the pandemic. Nobody could get together and do this. So, I think it's just the continuation of of gratitude. And again, these these people that you mentioned, 
they just exuded that. I mean, you just couldn't. It was so undeniable. People that are 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 doing it and living it. That's that's how they kind of carry themselves. They don't walk around like they own the place or they're God's gift to anything. There's just a there's a there's a gratitude, and, and it's bigger. The, the, it's bigger than any one person. I mean, it just is. You know, it's it's like a big collective thing. It's a family. You know, I mean, in a, in, a, in the corniest sense. I mean, it's so you you don't like you don't want to you don't want to take that for granted you know so that that was their that was always their message you know they they would talk about other things like you know well when you do this you know you know maybe exercise a little bit more taste or be a little bit more patient you know any number of craft oriented insights but but i think the general thing was more it was more humanistic it was more elemental and i and i i love that about about art and and music and and it's it's um putting kind of an emphasis on more of the ineffable aspects of it you know what i mean and trying to not make it about craft try to make it something about something more transcendent you know and you know charlie would really emphasize that you know certainly you don't need anybody to explain that you know brian blade is exuding that every every fiber of his of his being is exuding that you know von freeman was like that you know, Lynn Halliday didn't say much, but he he had this really loving aura, and he just loved the music and loved the people that he was he was playing with at any one time, and and he was so supportive. You know, I just think when you come to those situations with an openness, you're going to get that in return. You know, you're going to get the support that you that you need, and that that was that's what I'm trying to you know. Put, put back into the world at this point, you know what I mean? And if there's people that I'm teaching at any one time, that's that's the kind of spirit that I'd like to impart, you know. Let's say you have a dream tonight and you run into your, your younger self around the time you were getting ready to go out and become a professional. You could give your younger self one piece of advice based on what you've learned throughout your life up to this point. What would you tell that version of you? I would say don't worry. Don't worry so much. It'll be cool. Just, I mean, I, I was a little bit of a worrier when I was younger, and I wasn't sure. Uh, I mean, I knew that I loved the music, but I I didn't know if I had what it, I didn't know if I had it, you know what I mean? And I didn't, I just felt like I had the most to learn and the most to improve upon, and I just worried, you know, I didn't know, and I didn't, I just didn't know. And I, I, I could, I was, I spent a lot of energy being uptight about that. And don't worry and be patient. And that, those, those would be the two things. That, you know, don't, don't compare yourself to anybody. It's just, it's impossible for humans not to do that for some reason. And just keep enjoying, just enjoy the ride. Enjoy the ride. That's what I would say. If you could get into a jazz DeLorean time machine and go back in time and see somebody, who would you go see? Who would you love to see live? Oh, geez. I mean, that, 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 that could be so many things. I mean, I really, um, I would have liked to have seen Ellington's band with Jimmy Blanton. I would have liked to have seen the Coltrane Quartet, the classic quartet, you know, with Jimmy Garrison and, you know, Elvin and McCoy. Basie, I think, would have been amazing to see. Um, you know, I, I really, I, I, you know, I really would have loved to have seen, I would have loved to have been in the room during a Coltrane thing, you know. I, I, I really wish I could have seen that live, you know. Um, this sounds funny. I mean, I, I wish I could have seen Weather Report with Jocko like in, in 77 at that era, you know, in that era, I think that would have been, I think that would have been mind blown, you know, to see and hear something like that at that time. Definitely a train would have been for me, probably. I, I, you know, I always go, I always go back to train. I don't know. Yeah. It's just the model for me. Yeah. That you is know. the Cadillac of this answer for sure. For sure. Yeah. Uh, um, so everyone has a perception or an idea of who they think you are, your family, your friends, your fans, but ultimately you live your life. You have a perception of you. 
Who do you think you are? I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to be... I'm just trying to be a nice person and, and play this music the best that I can and exude some kind of uh, non-judgmental, you know, energy into the world and uh, just a super hard worker and, and um, you know, I'm sure you probably get a lot of, when you ask this question, I'm sure you get a lot of stuttering answers on the other end because it's, I think it's hard to, I think it's hard for people, at least in the world of, of music and art, to, to get people to talk about themselves, you know, sort of in any kind of, you know, qualitative way. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just grateful that I get to do what I do. And so I try, to, I try to proceed and move in the world with that in mind, you know, that I was for some, for whatever inexplicable reason, I was born into this era, into a, like a very objective level of um, luxury, you know, and I have, for whatever reason, a proclivity towards playing this music that I love so much and that I've been able to um, carve out a career playing this music. So I, I suppose I'm that. I mean, I'm also, you know, conscious. I'm consciousness, you know. So that's the most elemental answer. But I mean, in, in like in my body, you know, I'm in my body and I'm in this world at this time. So that's kind of how I think of that, you know, where I'm, I'm constantly just trying to be, a person that is grateful and that gets to do what they want to do um, in in light of the fact that a lot of people don't get to do what they want to do. So what, you know, who am I, what I'm, that, you know, uh, you know, that's, that's what I would say, but I, you know, I mean, you know, we're, if we're opening our eyes and we're seeing a physical world, we're just, we're just, we're pure consciousness, you know, I and mean, that's what it is. And um, the other stuff is just something that we do, you know what I mean? And so I, I'm kind of very much always thinking about stuff like that. You, you know what's interesting about this question is, is that, as you were saying before, the most interesting thing about this question is sometimes the best thing is the simplicity of what you, like, what, what you were saying, like just being fortunate to do what you do. And I think sometimes there's a notion because this question's so big that it does have to be really, really elaborate. Sometimes it's very profound when it's short because that's just the way it is. You know, that can... Well, that's why... Yeah, and I agree. And, and that's why once I st stop talking, I start thinking about, well, well, what am I? Well, like, what are we? we are, we're conscious. We're just consciousness. And so I would, I would leave it at that. I mean, I'll let yeah. people... People can think about that in their own way. It's, some, it's definitely something that I think about a lot, and um, and that helps me make decisions, you know, in terms of how I react to things around me and how how much I need to react and how deeply and emotionally intertwined that I get with something around me. You know what I'm saying? Because sure. it's kind of um, uh, an ever-moving target, if you know what I mean. Like, there's such a a relativity of what this is and it's changing every uh, moment. I mean, we kind of started off talking about that. I mean, we talked about it in the macro sense vis-a-vis -vis the pandemic. I mean, that's just a, that's just a, that's just what it is in a nutshell. That just happens to be the, the life situation that the whole world is in right now, you know, but I think that's what it is in my opinion, you know? And so it's like, well, I'm not a bass player. Yeah. I play the bass, and I write music, I'm, I do music, but I'm, I'm conscious, you know. I mean, let's get back to it, you know. That's maybe, that's just how I think about that kind of thing, you know. Absolutely. No, that makes total sense. Absolutely. Clark, man, this has been great. Thank you for opening up, taking some time out. Good luck, hopefully, as the world opens up and, and you know, the weather gets better and we all kind of move forward. 
Yeah, man, really good to talk to you. Thanks for listening and tuning in to another Neon Jazz interview. Where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in Chicago, Kansas City, and spots all over the globe, giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Clark for his time, music, and cool. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com. And for everything Neon Jazz all the time, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.